good morning everybody good afternoon good evening depending on where you're joining us from around the world i'm julia patrick really excited to have you here today for another episode of the nonprofit show we're going to be chatting with zach leverance ceo of seed spot welcome zach thank you thanks for having me julia you know this is like one of those huge topics that everybody wants to get the inside scoop and that is how do we get attain keep modern corporate partnerships a lot has changed over the last five years and um some of it would have changed anyway because of the pandemic mm -hmm. maybe others wouldn't have so we're going to get into rethinking how this all works and I can't wait to learn from you. Another thing that we learn from every day are our amazing partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Fridays just dedicated to fundraising. It's really exciting. And your part-time controller. I'm Julia Patrick, as I mentioned, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm flying solo today with Zach, but we have this amazing cohort of co-hosts. They come to us from around the country. They do very different things in the nonprofit sector. And um, I hope you've been able to get to know them and, and enjoy them. Okay, Zach, Seed Spot. I first uh, met your organization and you're telling me it's now 15 years, which freaks me out. Almost, 15 yeah. <laughs> Time flies. Okay, what is Seed Spot? Sure. Uh, and thanks for having me to yeah. talk about our work and uh, excited about this topic as well. It's an important part of our model and strategy. Uh, Seed Spot is a national nonprofit accelerator program that's focused on uh, educating and investing in primarily underrepresented entrepreneurs um, and in social impact businesses. So we provide a suite of um, incubator and accelerator programs for uh, really every shape and size of business. And we also customize and specialize programs that are you know, specific to our um, some of our core partners and to specific kind of societal issues that we can talk about later. We've been around for uh, yeah, going on 15 years, more like 13 this year, going on 14. Um, and we've had a lot of great success over that time. We've uh, we're born out of the Phoenix um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is still booming and now have a national footprint. We've served about um, 3,600 plus entrepreneurs over that time. They've gone and do amazing things. They're um, generating over $400 million in revenue. Uh, they've raised over $200 million in capital, which is just some of the ways we think about demonstrated success. They've mm -hmm. also um, created over 9,700 jobs. So our goal really at the end of the day and our vision is to leverage the tool of entrepreneurship as an opportunity for especially underrepresented communities who have been traditionally excluded from this opportunity to build generational wealth and prosperity. Um, and that, you know, business ownership is uh, among the most proven pathways to get to that goal. So we're excited to uh, talk a little bit more about how we build partnerships around that. I love it. I love that you have this concise um, and very measurable amount of information detailing what the impact is that's a lesson that we can all learn no matter what we're doing and i suspect zach as we um, navigate this conversation those those data points are going to be one of the things that you talk about <laughs> and help us to understand that we need to be thinking about this and we need to be able to articulate this with our partners so when we think about um the the corporate funding model that has been very specific it hasn't changed a lot until this thing called a global pandemic kind of pushed <laughs> our buttons um but i i suspect we were changing already we were you know these relationships were starting to change and and asking different things of one another what are you seeing and, and how is this now should we be thinking about this yeah it's a great it's a great point and good question i think you know, even before the pandemic, though, you know, the, the pandemic kind of served as an accelerant for everything. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think uh, even before the pandemic, we saw a shift in how corporate partnerships um, were being thought about, being designed and executed. Um, we've certainly experienced that. And I think primarily to distill it um, and as concisely as I can, I think 
there's a shift from traditional philanthropic corporate social responsibility and the mm -hmm. type of funding and grant making that that implies. And what I would, what I call at least in um, a framework that we like to borrow from um, what we call shared value partnerships. And that's mm -hmm. actually a framework that was designed, I think originally by uh, Professor Michael Porter at HBS, but has been, there's been many iterations of uh, what that means. And I think it also dovetails nicely with the concept of like collective impact, but essentially shared value at its heart is about ensuring that um, the nonprofit or social um, impact uh, partner, like, like what Seedspot represents is not just focused on uh, communicating our uh, impact via our programming, and expecting uh, corporate uh, partners to um, to just get on board with the kind of funding and support that that requires. I think that's a totally fine way to do it. But more and more, what we've seen is that getting really targeted and intentional about how the nonprofit understands the incentives and mm -hmm. value that they can provide, that we can provide to a corporate partner, mm -hmm. um, which takes a lot more time. It's a, it's a subtle shift, but it actually is, is uh, uh, something that's overlooked oftentimes by nonprofit leaders, really understanding, for example, the business model of a corporate partner and why they'd want to invest in a, even, you know, in a, um, in a nonprofit program that may have tangible impacts over time on their kind of business integrated strategy. It's a totally, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a legitimate way to think about how to build more sustainable partnerships, because the truth mm -hmm. is the shifting, winds and sands of uh, philanthropy um, often mean that sustainability for um, the old model of how we think about corporate funding and partnerships is is limited. Um, and right. so really getting into a place where you can make not just a philanthropic case, but also a business integrated case for why a partnership makes sense for a corporate is, uh, I think, a really important and, 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 um, and definitely in, 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 uh, um, a kind of more common way now to think about these partnerships. Right. I think we need to scrap this concept of being charitable. Like I've got my <laughs> hand out and, and you, yeah. you know, you need to be charitable to me because I'm doing the right thing. I think leadership wants to, um, and I think it's a demographic shift too. You know, I think newer donor investors want impact and they want to see, they want to understand what it means, not just to say, oh, it's wrong and we shouldn't have whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. um how do we solve it or how do we how do we navigate towards a solution doesn't mean we have to solve it tomorrow but we have right. to be navigating towards something as opposed to you know just having our hands out and and that charitable aspect and i know it's somewhat controversial to say because it, it seems harsh but i just think that it's the new it's the new direction that we're going. Well, well, I also think it can be, it doesn't need to be a, a zero sum like trade off. I think that yeah. it, 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 it can, there's a mutual value and mutual, uh, you know, what we refer to as win win situations where there yeah. is not a tension. Um, there sometimes is a tension on the kind of incentive of a corporate partner and the intended impact of the nonprofit partner. Mm -hmm. um, but when there's, and so we're looking for ways at seed spot where we, we're not compromising at all. In fact, we're amplifying and accelerating the impact we can have via a more intentional look at how corporate sponsors or funders or partners think about their own, um, their own goals and objectives. So like for, for example, um, I can give a couple examples of this, but one that comes to mind quickly at seed spot is that we are in a partnership with um, two organizations uh, called one called the Humana Foundation, which is the um, foundation arm of uh, Humana, the insurance provider, and the Volunteers of America organization, which is a national human services organization serving mm -hmm. about 400 communities, 2 million people a year. And we came together and we and we thought about the issue of um, solving for health equity among uh, uh, disadvantaged and low-income communities within the um, VOA footprint of 400 communities, which is a national footprint. Um, and how could we introduce new services, products, um, and approaches that are informed by those communities and can solve more directly for the social determinants of health that create these disparities and inequities in, in health outcomes for those communities. Um, we thought about that's obviously a, a really strong alignment with VOA's mission as a human services organization. 
Um, we at SeedSpot are experts in finding, sourcing, and then scaling and, and piloting uh, new interventions, products, services that have a social impact dimension to their, um, to their design. And then we found a third partner in the Humana Foundation, the corporate um, partner in this case, who cares a lot about those health equities for lots of reasons, including ultimately uh, cost reductions down the yeah. road in serving uh, populations that are um, experiencing these disparities. They're, they're, they're more expensive, obviously, uh, to, to serve when uh, the social determinants of health aren't being solved in ways that create better health outcomes. So that's one of these cases where we can actually have complete alignment between three separate partners, each providing a complementary kind of uh, component to the partnership that um, makes it greater than the sum of its parts and creates a sustainable model if we hit those outcomes because it's integrated into how we're all measuring our success and our impact over time. Um, so that's that's just one example, but uh, but when you can really align and continue to keep aligned the incentives for participation in a corporate partnership, um, more than just the annual renewals of a grant cycle uh, proposal, then uh, I think we can be more sustainable and more impactful at scale. Right. So let me dig a little deeper into that because I love that example. I love that there is the you know, the social outreach, the identification of an issue, that it's national, and that there's a reality that an economic reality for one of the main players. So yeah. let me ask you about this. Who in that relationship comes up with this strategy? Like, did, mm -hmm. did you all go towards Humana and say, this is how we can build a relationship, or this is what a partnership could look like? Or did they come back to you? I mean, how do we get this done, given that it's a changing way of looking at partnerships? And then who does these deep dives to figure out how this can all work? Yeah, I think it can uh, it can be any participant, any, any, any of the partners can like kind of be the what we call the backbone partner in a relationship okay. like this. And that's actually a borrowed uh, term from the collective impact framework. But usually these partnerships do have one central kind of organizing partner who makes sure that there is a common agenda that everyone's paying attention to, that we've all clearly defined our roles and accountability to those roles, that we have clear like cadence of communication, that we're continuing to uh, revisit the core assumptions about why this partnership creates the aligned incentives that we began with and adjusting those as needed because they, they're dynamic, they change over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this case, yeah, it was a combination of Volunteers of America and SeedSpot coming together, understanding that we had these complementary um, kind of service offerings. The, uh, the population that we aim to serve is one that VOA already serves. Um, the, the need to have new uh, products and services that solve for these health equity issues is one that we could help VOA approach and solve. And Humana, obviously, as I mentioned, had an interest in bringing together us both together to mm -hmm. uh, accelerate health out, you know, better health outcomes for these communities, which ultimately mm -hmm. long-term is, is, is good for their economics. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one example. I can think of one other quick example, which might be useful in my time prior to seed spot when I was a, you know, I'm, I call myself a recovering social entrepreneur now, <laughs> but when I was uh, founding an organization that I still um, sit on the board for, it's called everyone on, it was focused on uh, providing broadband access and, kind of digital literacy uh, skills to uh, communities that believe it or not in in the 20 in 2020 and, and even before still didn't have basic broadband internet mm -hmm. um, and in that case we went to internet service providers um, some of the by the way some of the most hated companies in the in the world <laughs> and uh, and we made a case for why we thought if they you know were able to uh, provide a discounted rate on basic broadband internet service, we, through our community partnerships and um, deep, uh, deep inroads in the in the communities that are disconnected, could right. drive adoption of those broadband offers at a price point at around ten dollars per month for what you know you and I pay seventy five to one hundred dollars for. Right. Still, just to give you some sense of how our, um, our communications, kind of our, our our internet service provision works, still at a, a cash positive margin for the ISPs. Um, mm -hmm. And we went and made that case for them about like kind of more about like customer acquisition. It's inevitable that one day we will find a way to connect every American because it's essential to uh, the future of workforce and economy. Um, and why not 
why not do it this way now and, and build um, deeper relationships? What I misunderstood, by the way, about their incentives, which is another point that's really important to make about how you get to these assumptions, was that I thought that uh, that would be enough. And the truth is, um, I missed I missed a piece around their incentive structure that really was focused on the average revenue per user and a deeply seated fear of cannibalizing existing customers through a discounted offer like this. So once we kind of uncovered that, um, we were able to create a, a combination of like programming models that uh, accounted for and addressed that eligibility piece with um, with the clear kind of uh, verification of eligibility that uh, also in, uh, included a discounted opportunity for um, the communities we were serving. And we've connected now over one and a half million Americans through that that program. And it led to ultimately the uh, the work that informed the um, the uh, affordable commu uh, community plan uh, for uh, ACP, which is the FCC's pandemic era uh, subsidy for for these kinds of uh, broadband plans. So that's just another example of how we were able ultimately to create a partnership model that still worked to get to the incentives that our corporate sponsors and partners needed to achieve and satisfy for us to actually scale the program and have the impact we, we chose. We could have, we could have, um, uh, you know, uh, been very focused on, on a very specific ISP and a very you know, specific geography um, and done, made it a small dent, but not really move the needle on this problem. But to, I think to really get it to be sustainable and at scale, we needed to think about how this was going to be a part of an, uh, an integrated business strategy for the ISPs as well. So really it, 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 great, two great examples because talking about the um, relationships and those partnerships, I love that um, everybody came to the table with what it was that they were looking for or what they needed. And it sounds mm -hmm. to me like through this trajectory, you had, um, I don't say back and forth, but you had discovery, needs discovery, as they say, and you had to have the flexibility to create this new type of partnership. How long do you think this process takes? Because mm. the, the old school, it's like, here's the plan, yay or nay, right? Versus kind of massaging these opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in some ways, of course, it's it's um, on a case by case basis, depending on like how much alignment already is in place before the partnership conversations begin. But I think it's, um, there is uh, a, uh, it takes longer than most people realize to get it right. And, and I think, and that's in, in part because I think good partnerships are relational. They're not transactional. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we are all humans and we, uh, we communicate and trust and build uh, relationships um, with each other in professional settings and personal settings. And that's really important in building um, a, a sustainable partnership is to understand that um, we are in uh, this together, that we're building a shared sense of um what success looks like and that we are ensuring that everyone's in, involved in defining that um and then we're holding ourselves accountable to those outcomes and our specific roles within the collective model that we've you know decided on so i think it takes a while to get that right um mm -hmm. and i think much like a fundraising pipeline to be honest there is a high failure rate um yeah. of like and i wouldn't say failure rate like we you get to go and then it fails i'm saying getting to go is uh, getting to a partnership and then actually implementing it, I would I would expect you know forty to fifty percent max success rate in okay. from the discovery phase to the implementation phase and how you do that and that's okay it's like any other pipeline um, you you're gonna you're gonna uh, build a pipeline that ultimately yields the partnerships you want but there'll be um, there'll be a lot of attempts that don't quite get there so really understanding too like what the um, bottom line criteria is for this successful partnership. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get there still in a very, uh, you know, that's okay, leaving the doors open for future opportunities. Or if like you realize there's not enough complementary value between the two partners and it's more duplicative, like those are another, that's another way that you could say, hey, let's not, let's not push this and fit a square, right. you know, peg into a round hole. Um, but that takes time to undercover and, and to do it right. I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'd put a specific number on it, but I say on average, 
we would spend a couple months building out the framework of what a partnership could look like before we actually get into any terms of, of how we might proceed. I love that you uh, painted that picture because I think that's really important. I want to navigate a little bit more through that and ask you the question, is the private sector ready to do this? Like, so when you talked about your two examples, were those entities like, holy moly, we never thought about this. Or were they like, oh, we've been wanting to do this. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because I do. Yeah. versus like the traditional, here's the deck. Like I said, is it a yes or a no? How how have you seen the landscape of, of reception to this? Yeah, and I think, uh, I think it is dependent on each company um, that we've, we've approached because, you know, I think shared value partnerships also require shared values, which is, you know, separate. <laughs> like we want to create tangible value uh, for each partner in exchange in a mutual way. But we also need to know that we're aligned on the big picture values and, uh, you know, philosophies we have for the social impact change we want to make. And sometimes that's just not there or it's not there to the level that it, that we need it to be. Um, I will mm -hmm. say that um, it's more often the case that we find willing partners, even in the, in the corporate sector, and sometimes they get a bad rap than yeah. uh, those who are you know looking for a PR halo or something that doesn't feel right. substantive. Uh, right. But I do feel like the nonprofit often needs to take that backbone role that I mentioned early and mm -hmm. and in taking the lead on discovering and doing the work to create the incentive structure that you can then pitch to a corporate sponsor and not just to their CSR team, but maybe to their marketing team and maybe to mm -hmm. their uh, you know their their, their 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 regional market managers and get to a place where you're having real conversations that allow them to say yes, because they are, because uh, you've done the work to understand their, their goals. I love, I love that allowing that. Now, when we, we don't have a lot of time and I could spend so much time with you because I love this concept. Um, how do we navigate towards longer lasting relationships? Um, not everybody is going to have a unicorn and rainbow experience, right? I mean, they're going to be mm -hmm. bumps and challenges and things that are going on and lessons learned. But how do we navigate forward when we do have issues or just so that we can create deeper relationships? What does that look like to you? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I think there are two things I'd call out. One is... Um, I think good shared value partnerships establish like a shared measurement um, mm. approach. So that means agreeing to track progress in the same ways, uh, which allows for uh, improvement and clear accountability to the outcomes. And it also allows us to tell the story of the successes, right? In ways that are reinforcing uh, for the partner and for the leadership of, uh, of the partner organization, as well as for your own stakeholders, right? Mm. Um, and then secondly, I think there, um, the backbone organization, it's incumbent on, on at least one of the partners in the in the partnership to uh, take the role in like building uh, and coordinating and aligning the efforts to be complementary and to maximize the value and to lead, uh, you know, good partnerships thrive on communication. So building yes. trust and authentic relationships among partners and participants that's supported by a regular cadence of, you know, both execution level, but also vision level check-ins and strategic, you know, planning um, is really, is really important because it, there's just something uh, very human about that too, is like the more time spent and the more uh, quality efforts put into designing something that feels and is demonstrated to be successful against the goals that we've all mutually agreed upon, then the logic model just starts to roll and make sense for the sustainability and continued work in that space. And you've now built real relationships that can weather some of the more, um, you know, dynamic things that happen inside of corporate uh, uh, foundations and corporate sponsors, like yeah. uh, a changing, um, you know, focus on their philanthropy. Right, right. Yeah, because it's never just one thing, right? Yeah. And I, I also feel, Zach, and I'd love you mentioned this, the, the, the communication piece. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it is something that it lands at the end of the project. It's got to be something that is ongoing yeah. and we're communicating and sharing and engaging. Um, what does that look like to you? Yeah, we do We do that all the time. I mean, we have a few calls today that are with our partners in their you know, biweekly check-in calls to ensure that 
where we kind of spend half of the agenda looking at um, what's happening right now in terms of the activities that we're engaged in together and the timeline upcoming, making sure that we're ready for uh, the next set of activities. But also then we take the moment to zoom out at, and look at our outputs and outcomes against the larger goals we have to think jointly about challenges that are either we were presently dealing with or anticipate we might deal with. Um, and, and, and what it does, it really builds a um, common sense of ownership and buy-in of the program and the outcomes in a really collect in a collective way, as opposed to um, just kind of showing up and signing a check. Uh, they feel right. invested in the, in the program. Right. Right. And, you know, I think we spend so much time now um, across all sectors of corporate America talking about employee retention and, and not just mm -hmm. attraction and growing, but, but these are the values that our, our staffs are looking at and the teams are wanting to know. And I feel like there's this internal, I mean, you use the PR halo effect, mm -hmm. which is undoubtedly a tremendous value, but mm -hmm. just the reality of how we cultivate that health within our organization. I've got to believe that in some of your corporate partners, this is just gold for them to take back to their teams to say, look, we're investing in this and we're engaging in this. We're not just writing yeah. the check. There's opportunities. Do you see that facilitation as well? Yeah. Sorry. Is the question, do I see the, uh, the facilitation of, of bringing, you know, your corporate partners teams more, more fully or mm -hmm. more deeply in engagement so that they can be a part of that journey as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, another, just to give you another example um, that feels aligned to this question, you know, we work um, with a few corporate partners who have one of the ways that we think about the shared value proposition that we make to them is around their employee engagement. Um, yeah. And we have needs from all sectors and all uh, industries for mentors and experts and content, you know, uh, speakers who can come into our programs and deliver know, a specific set of, uh, 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 you know, uh, edu educational content that are just, that's focused on that, that, you know, their expertise and their lived experience. And, uh, and that's one of the really interesting ways that we found um, sustainable partnerships with corporate uh, partners is around how we can engage in a mutually valuable way, their employees as mentors and content experts for our entrepreneurs. And mm -hmm. what you have there is a beautiful kind of reciprocal uh, valuable experience. Like we actually hear from the mentors that they uh, got as much, if not more from yeah. their experience uh, with the entrepreneurs as, as the entrepreneurs did, which I think is, um, you know, always a win-win. So I think, yes, having, as, and then just in general, as a principle, um, diversifying the relationships, the, the, the number, and I would say even like the leveling of relationships within a corporate yeah. partner is really important to the long-term, uh, you know, sustainability and in partnership. Uh, for obvious reasons around like, you know, turnover, but also that, that piece around like buy-in at different levels of the, of the corporate spot, uh, partnership. And when you have, even at the uh, base, like we do with our employee engagement programs, the employees themselves kind of, uh, asking for more, uh, yeah. it's hard for, it's hard for, uh, uh, you know, a partner to say, ah, we don't want to do that. So I think okay. there's a, you know, a win-win there and in, in building out a diverse set of relationships across the uh, partner organizations. Yeah, I love this. Zach, this has been an amazing conversation. I I um, am so, so thrilled that uh, your team reached out to our team and, and we could get you on because it's really been a fabulous conversation. And these are the types of conversations that we have on the nonprofit show, but linking it up to what SeedSpot is doing and, and uh, your vision for a future of integration has really been tremendous. So thank you so much. Zach Leverance, CEO of SeedSpot. Check out seedspot.org and you can learn about their amazing work. They're available all over the country. They have a digital component. They have a lot going on. And this is the new way forward with partnerships and sponsorships. So get on board and learn as much as you can. I do believe that this is... Um, going to be for so many folks unlocking a key to success that they've struggled with. Um, because no matter how great your idea is, Zach, you probably see this every day like I do. You can have amazing ideas, amazing integrity and drive. But if you don't have those tools to put things together, 
they don't yeah. go forward. And it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's heartbreaking, but seed spot can really be a part of that journey yeah. for so many and so, folks. And so many, yeah, thank you. And so it's just the last thing, so many of these uh, societal issues that we try to solve require cross-sector, you know, collective yeah. approaches to make a dent and to move the needle. And so it's not just, um, I think it's advantageous to uh, nonprofit leaders to think about partnerships this way. I think it's actually necessary to really uh, make the change that we that we're hoping to make in on all the, all the important issues that we address. Yeah. Well, this has been marvelous. I am thrilled that we could spend this time with you. Um, thank you, Zach Leverance, again, CEO of SeedSpot. Um, check out SeedSpot.org. They're just truly amazing. We also want to give a shout out of gratitude to our amazing partners, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and Your Part-Time Controller. These are the folks that allow us to have these amazing uh engagement time with, like we've had with Zach and uh, his group at Seed Spot today. So thank you so much. Zach, as we end every episode, we have this mantra. We've been doing it since the beginning, since the very first show, 1200, nearly 1200 episodes ago. And it means something so different to me after having chatted with you. And it's really powerful. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow.